Good evening, everyone. We are going to start today's Granby Board of Education meeting. Today's date is Wednesday, November 17th. Jordan Grossman, Superintendent of Schools, presiding over our organizational meeting. As many of you know, we did have recent elections, and at this meeting, we need to determine who are going to be the Board of Education officers. So as your superintendent of schools, it is my job to start off. Are there any nominations for the position of board chair? No second for the nomination is necessary. The bylaws by the Granby Board of Education call for all written votes for boards, board elections. So after the board chair is elected, the meeting is handed off to the newly elected chair. So at this time, I will accept any nominations for board chair. I would like to nominate Sarah Thrall. And if I can just uh, say a few words about Sarah. Sarah has been our board chair for the last year. Year? Yeah. And she's done a phenomenal job. She has, uh, she is a great consensus builder. She really has the best interests of all of our children. She puts that first and foremost. Um, I am constantly reminded that, um, you know, um, this is a volunteer position and the, we, we always say, oh, there's just two meetings a, a month. Mm -hmm. But the time and energy that Sarah has put into this is far more than uh, two meetings a month that, that we see. Um, so I really want to thank her for uh, all the work that she has done to date and um, think she should continue. Thank you, Rosemary. Are there any other nominations for board chair? As I see none for nominations of board chair, I will be passing out uh, ballot votes and what you would need to do is for chairman, you would put who you would want for chairman and just for record purposes, if you can also put your signature on the bottom of that. So Christina, Monica, Donna. Thank you. Dave is not here. Whitney, Sarah Thrall, Rosemary Weber. So after, if you vote for Sarah Thrall or whoever you may want to vote for, please put that name in that line and then sign it, please. And then you can pass it to me. Just, yeah. just, oh, sure. just for the sake of keeping everything official. Okay. So I will uh, read these really quickly. Uh, Rosemary Weber, Sarah Thrall, Whitney Sanzo, Sarah Thrall, Christina Gilton, Sarah Thrall, Monica Logan, Sarah Thrall, Donna Nolan, Sarah Thrall, Sarah Thrall, Sarah Thrall. <laughs> so I see there are six members here right now. Six members, six zero for Sarah Thrall being the next Grammy Board of Education Chair. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you for trusting me to continue serving as the Chair of Grammy's Board of Education. It's a responsibility I do not take lightly, and I am grateful for your support. The Board of Education is not a one-person operation, it is a team, and I'm thankful to be surrounded by this team. I'm looking forward to working with each and every one of you on behalf of Granby students, so thank you. Um, I will go ahead and continue with the elections, and I would like to call for nominations for Vice Chair. I would like to nominate Rosemary Weber thank as you. Vice Chair. Thank you, Donna, and I don't believe we need a second for the Vice Chair nominations as per the guidelines you cited before. Is that correct, Dr. Grossman? As long as there's no other nominations. Are there any other nominations? <clears throat> okay. I will, we will um, continue with the process as we did last time. Each ballot will have um, your name on it. So Christina Gilton and the nominee is Rosemary Weber, Monica Logan, Donna Nolan, Kate Helling, 
Whitney Sanzo, Sarah Thrall, Rosemary Weber. And again, please sign that at the bottom when you are finished, please. Rosemary Weber, Monica Logan, Rosemary Weber, Whitney Sanzo, Rosemary Weber, Rosemary Weber, Rosemary Weber, Christina Gilton, Rosemary Weber, Sarah Thrall, Rosemary Weber, Donna Nolan, 6 0. Congratulations. Congratulations, Rosemary, and thank you for your service. I am looking forward to working with you for sure, or continue working with you. So. Uh, and finally, um, We'd, I would like to ask for nominations uh, for the secretary's position. I would like to nominate Donna Nolan for the position of secretary. Donna Nolan has been nominated. Are there any other nominations? Okay. Continuing uh, with the same ballot, Donna Nolan is, uh, has been nominated. Christina Gilton, Mona Lo Monica Logan, excuse me, Donna Nolan, David Pelling. Uh, Whitney Sanzo, Sarah Thrall, Rosemary Weber, and again, if you could write the name of the person for whom you're voting and then make a, your signature, please. Thank you. Okay. Donna Nolan, Monica Logan, Donna Nolan, Whitney Sanzo, Donna Nolan, Rosemary Weber, Donna Nolan, Christina Gilton, Donna Nolan, Donna Nolan, <laughs> Donna Nolan, Sarah Thrall. Congratulations, Thank Donna, you, Donna Nolan. Thank you. Donna, thank you for your service. The next piece of business um, under our organizational meeting that we need to address is assignments of subcommittees. As you all know, we do have two uh, subcommittees that the Board of uh, Education operates on a monthly basis. The first being the Curriculum Policy Technology Communication Subcommittee, and the second being the Finance and Personnel Fac Facilities Committee. Uh, Rosemary, would you be willing to um, we, as many of you may know, we have zero members remaining on our finance committee, so we need to do a little bit of um, readjustment. Um, Rosemary, would you be willing to move over as an experienced board chair or board uh, member and chair the finance committee? Absolutely. Be Wonderful. Thank you. Um, so, Rosemary Weber will be chairing our finance subcommittee. Uh, Donna, would you be willing to serve on that committee with Rosemary? Absolutely. I'd be proud to. Thank you. Monica, would you also be willing to serve on the Finance Committee? Yes, I'd love to. Thank you very much. So, Rosemary Weber will be chairing the Finance Subcommittee with uh, board members Donna Nolan and Monica Logan uh, serving as committee members. Thank you all for your volunteerism. We appreciate it. With Rosemary moving over to chair from the Curriculum Committee to chair the Finance Committee, uh, that leaves our chairmanship of the curriculum subcommittee open. I've spoken with Dave Pelling, and he has offered to step up. Dave, um, as many of you may know, is an educator. He's actually at parent-teacher conferences tonight, so he's definitely excused for that this evening, as we can we certainly value that. So he uh, is a teacher over at West Hartford. Dave has um, has offered to step up and is willing to serve as chair of our curriculum subcommittee. So thanks to Dave for doing that. Whitney, would you be willing to serve on the committee for yes. the curriculum? It would be my pleasure. Thank, thank you. you, Whitney. And Christina, would you also be willing to serve I on the curriculum? I definitely subcommittee? would. Thank you. Perfect. So Dave Pelling will be our chair of the curriculum subcommittee with Whitney Sanzo and Christina Gilton as members. So thank you all again. All right. And with that, I think that's it for the organizational meeting. But there's more to come. <laughs> so, so don't leave. <laughs> so thank you very much. Um, We'll move on to the administrative reports. Um, the Chairman's Corner, uh, just again, thank you. Welcome to everyone, um, especially to our, our performers this evening. I'm very excited to hear the performance that we have from Wells Road School um, with, the via, with the Strings Program. Also a very special welcome to our newest board members, 
Christina Gilton, Monica Logan, Donna Nolan, and Whitney Sanzo, all of whom were officially sworn in earlier this evening. And thanks to Rosemary Weber and David Pelling, as well as our student reps, Tess Bajak and Jacob Scotto for, for continuing along with their, their service. Um, I'm very grateful to have all of your leadership and experience on the board. And with that, Dr. Grossman, I'll turn it over to you. Super, thank you, Mrs. Thrall. And again, congratulations to all our new board members and our board members and student board members that have been with us in the past. Good evening, everyone, and welcome. What a great night it is tonight. We have a wide variety of families and friends here tonight to welcome Mrs. Jessica Fawcett, our new strings teacher to the Granby Public Schools and some of her fifth grade students who are here to present schools in a spotlight, which we'll get to shortly as well as Angela Aaronworth, our new director of pupil services. And I know there are many um, special uh, education families and general education families that are here also to support uh, Mrs. Aaronworth's uh, presentation tonight of her continuous improvement plan. Want to do a big congratulations to our drama club on their performance of Radium Girls last week. I had the opportunity to attend this person, this play in person and it, it was just a wonderful experience for our students in our crowd, so I want to congratulate them. I also had the opportunity today to attend our Best Buddies Friendsgiving, and what an exciting event that was. They, it, it, it was just great seeing uh, kids eating together and having fun together in, in a great event. Our Best Buddies ha have done a, a, an event once a month now, and they have a holiday gathering in the next month too. So congratulations to them. I want to congratulate this board. Mrs. Strahl and I were able to attend the Cave Caps Conference on Friday and this board received the level two award and that is a, one of the highest honors that a board of education could receive from the Connecticut Association of Boards of Education. We also were presented with the spring 21 Bonnie R. Carney Award for Excellence for Educational Communication presented to the Granby Public Schools for our Stronger Together plan, our reopening plan for last year and this year. So I want to congratulate the board and also a special congratulations to Mrs. Parsons and Mrs. Weber and Mr. Dunn who led the effort of putting that plan together. That, that's a very high honor by the Connecticut Association's Board of Education. Thank you to Mrs. Powell and the staff for working on the fall addition to the vision that will be in the drummer in the next couple weeks. We also want to congratulate middle school principal Taylor Rye, who's been invited to participate in a series of focus groups to share thinking on what should be considered in the design of first virtual learning standards for Connecticut public schools. The high school will participate in a program called Voice for Change, this is a first of its kind statewide civic engagement initiative. Voice for Change empowers high school students to promote and vote on how more than $1.5 million in federal relief funds will be invested to reimagine Connecticut schools. This was a meeting that I attended. I reached out to the high school to see if they wanted to participate. We are the only Farmington Valley High School that is participating in this program. Very exciting. I do need to make a plea. We are still in need for bus drivers and substitute teachers. So if that is something that you would like to do or know someone that would like to do that, please contact our business office. The FY budget is well underway and meetings continued this week with administrators. The plus one budget will be presented to the board on January 5th and I will be at a meeting in December letting you know the budget timeline. There were various celebrations across the district for Veterans Day. Last week, Kelly Lane and Wells Road had outdoor celebrations in the middle school and high school honored the day during classroom time. I do got to say, to see Kelly Lane and Wells Road come together probably for the first time in two years as a school community in a, a, an assembly was probably the best time and the best event that I could have seen as the superintendent of schools for them to come together for the first time and honor our veterans. On behalf of the board, I would like to uh, thank you all for the work and the commitment that you are about to set up. 
Our next regular scheduled board meeting will be held on Wednesday, December 1st. I will take any questions out of the superintendent's office at this time. Thank you, Dr. Grossman. Uh, do any board members have comments or questions for Dr. Grossman for his report? And I would certainly be remiss if I didn't uh, thank our very own veteran, Rosemary Weber, for her service. So, Rosemary, thank you for your service as well. So, thank you. Yes. Uh, Assistant Superintendent's report, Mrs. Persons. <laughs> um, good evening, everyone. Um, I'm excited to share with you um, a little bit of a COVID update and then moving more into curriculum, which I hope to spend many more of my monthly updates in. So last week, we were able to announce to the community our participation with the screen and stay alternative um, to quarantine that had previously been announced by the governor. This program allows us under certain conditions, such as when students are seated in the classroom, on buses, and outside when supervised, um, that students will be able to remain in school while their parents monitor their symptoms for COVID-19. What that looks like is that um, there's a sign-off form that is in a Google form um, that, that has the parent read through the parameters of the program and signs off and then our nurse uh, checks that form and checks in with the student. Um, unfortunately, there are circumstances where this still does not apply. Uh, screen and stay does not apply to out of school um, exposures, uh, areas where mask compliance may not be strong, uh, lunch when masks are off, and activities where there's a um, projection of speech, such as chorus, band, and um, highly aerobic PE. So that has been received very well. We've been able to apply that in about four different cases um, to this point. And one of the things we also shared in our communication last week is that a lot of our communications are going to shift to a building level around COVID cases. And our principals will be doing a lot of direct communication with families. We will continue to update the dashboard on our Granby Public Schools website. And we encourage families to continue to stay diligent. Again, our community is why we've been able to weather all of this so well but we have seen six to seven cases over the past four or five weeks, each week. Um, so COVID is definitely still alive and well. Um, right now, um, we have a vaccine clinic that is going on at the high school. This is a clinic that is run by Farmington Valley Health District, and we are um, just supporting them with the facility use. They will um, administer over the first vaccine to over 350 five to 11 year olds this evening at Granby Public Schools, and it's one of three clinics that they are running um, over the course of two weeks. And our own Tess was there with National Honor Society. Um, they did a service project this evening in helping to entertain the students while they waited for their 15 minutes after their vaccine shots. Um, we also continue to encourage families, um, if and when they decide to get uh, their students vaccinated, to send their cards in for our school nursing staff to, um, to have on hand. So in the non-COVID world, there's been a lot of budget meetings going on. We, we look forward to budget season. Um, and in out of my office, that involves a lot of monitoring of staffing, looking at new textbooks and courses that are being proposed. It's a great time to review all of the software that we use in the district. Um, and you will see coming forward, just a quick preview, a continued discussion around our math programming, especially in the K to, K to um, kindergarten to 10th grade range and um, the bringing of readers and writers workshop up to grade six. So those are things we've talked about, but those will th be see things that you also see in our budget. Um, I had the honor to see our illustrative math consultant come and work with the, with the middle school this week, and they were working on how to implement lessons. Uh, one of the key pieces of illustrative math is asking the right questions to students as they're working. And so our consultant was able to model some of those questions and teachers were able to work interactively with her. Um, additionally, we've, been, uh, we've just wrapped up all of our goal setting observation meetings for all of our teachers in the district with their evaluators. And one thing I wanted to highlight as a last, um, as a last item is that we also submitted our Perkins grant, which supports our college and career. Um, areas at the high school and this year we are partnering with Canton for that so you have to apply as a consortium and this is a great opportunity for us to work with them on our um, CTE councils 
and uh, collaborate on courses and exciting things that we're offering across districts. That is all I have for you. Are there any questions? So I just have a quick question. Um, how many, I know the last update you provided, um, you said there weren't a lot of new texts or courses necessarily, but more kind of just like revisions within yes. courses. Is that is that still the case, or are we looking to potentially have the curriculum subcommittee look at and approve texts and courses? So there are, um, we started the look last time we met, and we'll look again um, right after the Thanksgiving break. Um, when we reconvene with the subcommittee. There are no new textbooks on the docket this year. Um, we do have three courses that are either new or a significant enough revision to bring forward. Um, you will see in the budget curriculum writing to revise some of our other courses, um, but it's not significant revisions. There are, um, you'll see three courses being brought forward. Okay. And does, uh, just because you're speaking budget, yeah. I know Lester of Math is kind of at the middle school right now. It's being Correct. being piloted a unit or, uh, or two here and there in the elementary and intermediate schools. Um, is that is there going to be a budget implication for Lester of Math on a bigger scale? Yeah, so there's always a budget implication for a math programming overall. Um, if and when we do switch programs um, in illustrative math is right now the front runner, but that would be something that would come out of the sub curriculum subcommittee. Um, we are making sure in the budget that we allow for any, um, you know, the slight increase in costs that would come with a new implementation. Um, but there are always, there is always dollars allocated already to math that we would just reallocate to this resource, but there might be a little bit of an uptick. So we are trying to plan for that in okay. the budget. And probably professional development would increase yes. for that as well. So, okay. Yeah. Thank you. Any other questions for Assistant Superintendent Jennifer Parsons? You looked like you were ready to go, Rosemary. So I, I just had a question um, about, you said illustrative math is the front runner at this point. If that were no longer to be the case, would whatever program or resource the district is, uh, you know, decides to go with, um, would we get a preview of that? Yes, 100%. Thank you. Okay. Any other questions, comments? Great. Thank you very much, no Mrs. Parsons. All right, Tess and Jacob, student representative reports. It has been a busy week in, a, in sports, I know, for Granby Memorial High School. It was on um, the news last night. I know. Was it, was it volleyball that was on the news? Field hockey? Yeah. yeah. Uh, and uh, soccer. 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 Yeah. Yeah, so good. What, tell us what's going on. Tell us the results. I know the results, but, <laughs> but maybe not everybody does. <laughs> Um, good evening, everybody. So our boys soccer team made it to the quarterfinals last week, but sadly lost. Um, girls field hockey played last night in their semifinals game, but also sadly lost. Um, girls volleyball also played in their semifinals game last night, but also sadly lost. And um, <laughs> I'm sorry that I'm speaking so negatively. Um, girls soccer also made it to the semifinals and lost last night, but we do congratulate all of our sports teams for making it as far as they did in the state tournament. On a lighter note, there's a football game this Friday, but on another sad note, it is our last home game of the season, and football will then go into playoffs. And wrestling had a meeting this week to discuss the upcoming season, and I know indoor track, swim, wrestling, hockey, cheer, and basketball are all starting conditioning and prepping for their winter seasons ahead. And as Ms. Parsons spoke on, I did have the privilege of helping out at the Children's Vaccine Clinic tonight at the high school, and it was a great honor, and I had a lot of fun hanging out with the kids, so thank you. Thanks, Jacob. The National Honor Society held their annual turkey trot today and collected over $813 to be get donated to uh, those in need in the Grammy community and uh, surrounding communities as well. Uh, coffee House, our uh, fall coffee house will be held this Saturday at 7 p.m. in the high school auditorium. Tickets are $5 and can be bought online or at the door. And the show will be live streamed as well. Um, I encourage you all to come. Tess and I will both be performing. So. Um, if you could want to come watch us sing, then that, that'd be great. Um, together? No, no. Oh, uh, maybe next time. <laughs> oh, <good>. um, <laughs> drama auditions for the spring musical will be held on December 10th, uh, and they have decided on the show uh, will be Guys and Dolls. Oh, um, my gosh. Chamber, and the uh, Chamber Singers will also have their first uh, performance uh, on December 10th as well. So, yeah, a lot of, a lot of really great things coming up here. We have so much talent at our high school, so, um, and clearly with you two as well. Tess, what did you do to entertain the kids tonight? 
Um, so it was, I actually knew like a lot of the kids from like babysitting and like I actually taught some of them in the dance class I teach, but um, so we had like a big table set up with like snacks and like coloring sheets or like word searches and a lot of the kids like got really excited about the snacks. We just kind of like made them feel better like about getting their vaccine and like made them feel like good about it and like distracted them and there was a movie playing when Mr. K set up for us back there so <laughs> Mr. K so there was a movie playing for them and actually I think a lot like a lot of the kids actually saw like each other like from school so it was actually just like a really happy environment in the community gym so it was that's good. awesome thanks for doing that yeah. questions for Jacob and Tess I'd, I'd like to make a comment too of my children my my two children were there and oh, really? very much appreciated the the snacks and, um, <laughs> <laughs> and it was something to look forward to after the vaccine so thank you very much for being there it made a difference there was a, a sort of a sense of community there it made them feel less frightened they could see their friends it was great thank you nice and our younger students really love and look up to our older students so that makes it a lot of fun so Definitely. thank you guys great all right we will move on to uh, business manager's report is with Anna Robbins. This is Robbins. Good evening. Um, tonight we're um, just going to have a quick review of the October statement of accounts. Um, the Board of Ed chose a positive forecast in October of $161,000, which is better than last month by $43,000. Um, special education expenditures are projected to be unfavorable $20,000 and regular education expenditures are projected to be favorable $181,000. So the driving factor of the positive forecast in regular education continues to be turnover in personnel. Um, special education expenses are forecasted to be over budget for the year with a slight favorable change from last month. Um, the positive variances in special education um, in out-of-district transportation, certified staff, and teaching assistants have offset the over-budget condition in tuition. So um, that was helped us to level out. Um, we also track quality and diversity um, fund balance, and that is projected to be favorable um, for the year at 106. Um, we had lower magnet school enrollment. Um, but we also had lower than budgeted enrollment for open choice um, and we um, so that lowered our revenue a little bit and um, we did not run summer school revenue um, producing summer school pro um, programs this year so both revenues and expenses were lower than anticipated revenues to the town are projected to be better than budgeted by 21,000 um, um, we have reported um, enrollment to the state, so now we're uh, able to bill other towns for tuition. We have Heartland students that um, join us, and um, it is um, there. We're two students higher than budgeted, so we're doing a little bit better there. Um, and um, what else is better? Uh, oh, we just we just bill the special education expenses to other towns. And well, um, that appears to be slightly better as well. Excess cost is a little bit lower than budgeted. That excess cost grant goes directly to the town, um, but it all figures into the overall um, town um, budget projections. So um, athletics is expected to proceed as normal, so our pay to participate fees um, should be right on budget as well, so we'll keep an eye on that. Um, so there's October. It's funny to report on October when November is almost done, but we'll see you again in December to let you know how November's going. Any questions? Thank you, Anna. And I do know that we had um, a, a finance committee meeting yes, on Friday did. to overview this, and they reviewed it, and everything was in order, and they said thank you very much. And again, I'll just remind you, that was Jenny Emery, Mark Fiorentino, and Melissa Migliaccio, all who have um, retired or, or moved on to, uh, been elected to other positions. So, okay. any questions um, from the current board for Mrs. Robbins? Wonderful. Right. Thank you very much. Thank you. All right, the moment we have been waiting for. Um, I don't know where Miss Foskett is. There she is. Okay. Oh, hello. <laughs> and we have Mrs. I don't know who's doing the intro. Is there a grand intro? Who am I calling up here? Mrs. Greer. Okay. <laughs> 
So we have some a very special performance from Wells Road School. So Mrs. Greer, we do. So uh, I have some very we have some very excited students who have actually been studying. If I think about string for the last couple of years. Um, and actually, it's amazing to see how quickly they move. We also thank Mrs. Foskett. Um, Mrs. Foskett um, comes to us with a great performance background, and it is truly one of the highlights of the day to kind of go through the halls and hear such beautiful music. So uh, we have today five fifth grade students. Um, I'm, I'm making sure I'm catching everybody. So we have Megan Rice. Come on, come on. <laughs> Britton Malone, Katie Owlpow, Andrew Harvey, and Alana, and I don't want to pronounce your name wrong, Mar, correct? Yes. Um, <laughs> for all uh, students with Mrs. Foskett, so I hope you enjoy this wonderful ensemble. I'm so excited. <laughs> My name is Megan. I'm going to be showing you how to hold a bow. So the first thing you're going to do is put your thumb by the grip and point it upwards. Yeah, okay. Next thing you're going to do is you're going to point your uh, index finger. You're going to bend it over the top of the bow. Now you're going to put your index finger or uh, middle finger and ring finger hanging over the side. Lastly, you're going to put your pinky pointing up at the end of the bow. Hi, my name. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, my name is Britton, and I'm gonna show you rhythms. Mississippi hot dog. Down pony, up pony. And grandma rides a motorcycle. show you the names of each string. This is E, A, E, Our first piece is called Open String Blues.
Science Club Hot Cross Fun. We're almost out of here. <laughs> I wish I had just an ounce of your talent that you just had. I have one question. Um, what grade did you guys start playing strings? I'm assuming you're all fifth grade, right? Did you start in second grade? Do you remember? Second grade. Okay, so most of you started in second, except for you started in fourth, you said? I'm so impressed. That was really fantastic. And Ms. Foskett, I, um, Mrs. Greer alluded to it, but could you tell us just a little bit about what your performance background, your background is? Because sure. I know um, we're very proud of that. So um, I, um, well, I was a freelance performer and a teacher until um, a couple of years ago when I wanted to be on the same schedule as my family. <laughs> it's hard to see your kids when you work nights and weekends. Um, so uh, I, but before, coming to teach strings here, I was teaching at the Hart School for 10 years in their community division. Um, I got my master's at the Hart School. Um, I played with the Hartford Symphony. I just played with them actually a couple weeks ago and I just turned down another concert because there's only so much one person can do. Um, I played with Springfield Symphony regularly as well. Um, I had a tango band for about 10 years. I had a string quartet for about 10 years and once I had kids, I had to sort of slow all that stuff down. Your time goes in other places. Right. Um, well, we're glad I'm, you're here. I'm happy Welcome. about that too. <laughs> Welcome. But I feel like all of those different things have sort of given me, um, all of this experience has given me things to bring, if that makes sense, to teaching. So what is the next step for these students? Because I know that as we've heard about strings, we've heard about moving on to other instruments. I know we're all working with the violin right now. Um, what does that program look like and how, how does it develop, especially so for these This year for these guys, I want to get some um, more music reading going. Right now we do a little bit of um, reading of iconic notation, which is like letters, um, not just pure reading off of the staff. I do a mixture of reading off the staff and letters and then learning by ear as well. I just want to get these guys playing together. Playing and performing is what I feel like what builds the program because that gets you, that's, you're excited, that's exciting. It's fun for us, it's fun for you, right? Um, but I want to learn to read music more um, because that helps you learn more songs, which is fun, which then you can perform. You know, it's kind of a really great um, circle that you have to kind of propel, if that makes sense. Yeah. Um, so yeah, um, next year we're hoping to add viola and cello, both at Wells and in the middle school. So. Um, next fall, a lot of violinists will have the choice, hopefully, of um, violin, viola, or cello um, at bass, late in middle school or in high school, so we can have an orchestra some, some years down the road. These guys are only going to be in sixth grade, obviously, so we have some, some years to develop that. Right. And do any of you play another instrument besides the strings? Are you playing like a brass instrument or a woodwind? I'm just curious. Well, I play a clarinet. We have a clarinet? I play clarinet, too. Another clarinet? I play trombone. 
You play trombone? Wow. That's impressive. I played the trombone too, so good. I play flute. Flute? You also have singers. Oh my goodness, multi-talented. So I don't want to hog the show. Anybody else have any comments or feedback, questions for either Ms. Vosk? Go ahead, Rosemary. I, I would like to ask the students, and anyone can answer this question, what was the hardest thing um, for you when you got started with the violin? Um, I think probably learning how to do the bobo. It really takes a lot of time to adjust and like get used to. Thank you. And now you can all do really hard things, right? <laughs> so that, that was great. Practice, Thank practice, you. practice. Practice, yeah. yeah. Well, wonderful. Questions? Anybody else? No? I know uh, Mrs. Gilton was saying she was excited to see the performance because she was on the Granby Education Foundation when they uh, provided the grant for the strings program. So it's really fun to kind of see it full circle. So. Yeah, it's great to actually see it come to fruition. I keep telling like every class, like when I start, when I, I was nervous of open the, opening the instruments because I know they've been played for several years. They're beautiful. Every time I let the classes play them, I'm like, these are so nice. You have to be really careful. <laughs> you guys got us like such beautiful instruments. Okay. So thank you. Like in strings, that makes such a big difference. I think the whole goal was to have it be a long-term yeah. program. So to start them in second grade and then to see that. And as you were talking about the orchestra, that's what we talked about three or four years ago when we were when we were approving the grant, is that that was the goal, was to hopefully get the kids excited and then want to continue. So it's coming to fruition, which is which is fantastic. Pretty, it's awesome. I saw Tess and Jacob looking at each other because they're both very musical, and they were, I think they were just a little bit jealous. <laughs> <laughs> Am I right? Yeah, you guys? Yeah, not an option that we can <laughs> yeah. yeah, we never, I was like, that's what Jacob and I talked about. Like, we never got that opportunity, so it's great to see like that they have this opportunity. And it's also really cool that you guys all like other play other instruments as well, because that's really impressive. So keep it up. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, great. Well, thank you all. We are so grateful for you being here. Lots to be proud of at Wells Road School. Thank you, Mrs. Greer. And I know that you um, brought your family, so I'm glad they were able to see this performance. I'm not sure, families, have you seen your children perform their instruments? Because I don't think they come home with them. So was this a first opportunity for you? Awesome. Well, I'm glad you were here to see that. Um, so you are welcome to stay to the meeting. However, this is also a perfect opportunity. <laughs> So, so this is a perfect opportunity if you would um, like to would like to leave. It's certainly acceptable to leave at this time. But thank you so much for being here. I think they we'll give you all just a minute. I know you have to pack up your instruments, so we'll just take a minute. But I just want to point out too to my colleagues on the board. Did you see how they all came in? Like they were ready to perform from the very beginning. So they came in, they exited, they went over to their space. So very well done. the students and to see them in action and to see all the hard work that our staff and administration puts into uh, their success. So thank you to everyone. So I'm going to proceed with our agenda. You're not bothering us as you leave, so don't worry. Um, so we'll just continue on um, to public comment. And thank you again to Wells Road and to Mrs. Greer and all of our students and families for being here tonight. Uh, Granby community engagement and attendance at Board of Education public meetings is welcome. The public comment segment of the meeting agenda is set aside so the Board of Ed may receive public comments. Procedurally, public remarks will be limited to five minutes and citizens will be asked to identify themselves. Because the Board of Ed is limited by the Freedom of Information Act to discussing only matters on the agenda, the Board of Education is not permit permitted to engage in a discussion of the comments presented. 
as we've been practicing since this world of um, hybrid meetings. Uh, if anyone in the public that is here with us this evening in town hall would like to make public comment, please come up and identify yourself. Um, after which time we will then go over to our friends who are joining us via um, Zoom. If you are on Zoom and would like to make a public comment, please raise your hand or make yourself known and we will, uh, we will have you come. Would anyone in public tonight like to make a comment? Hi, Eileen. Yeah, I think it's there. Is it? Yeah. <coughs> You'll be able to hear me. Okay, thank you. No worries. Uh, the first thing I'd like to say is uh, for the board to consider and the new members who were brought on here recently, Christine, welcome. Um, and here's something for you all to consider, especially those with special education backgrounds. If you continually under budget special education, you will continually be over budget. Okay? Listen to that again. If you continually under budget special education, you will always be over budget, okay? With that being said, I want to, as most people know, um, I'm an advocate and an attorney in, in Connecticut, um, an advocate in New York and Massachusetts, an attorney in special education law. I represent a lot of families within the Granby School District. We recently have had a change, and we've brought uh, Angela Aaronworth on board here. And I have to say, I am, and most people know, I am a fan of Jordan Grossman. And I grow more each day to be his fan as he brings on personnel that are making positive and good changes to our students with special education needs. He has been an active and supportive member of the SEPTO, which we have started, and has been actively involved in the last two years or so. It's been a long time coming. And when he brought Angela on, it was... Um, he invited people in the SEPTO and people in the special education community to be part of that committee to be involved in who was going to be the next director of pupil services. And I have to say I have heard nothing but positive things about Angela. I, as a parent, have experienced Angela's um, activity in the district and I find it just superb. Her demeanor and her willingness to work with families is what we've been seeking in this district for a long time. As an advocate sitting across the table from her, I find her to be very um, engaging, willing to think outside the box, willing to work with the families. Uh, never have I heard people say that she's condescending or not listening. I've only heard really good things from families and from staff working with her about the changes that are coming on. I've heard Jordan. I've been skeptical because this district has had a long, hard history with special education. I've given him the benefit of the doubt, and I am so pleased with where we're going. That's not to say that we're not going to stay on top of this, because we will. That's why SEPTO is here. And I hope that the people that came new to this committee, to this uh, Board of Education, will stay on top of that as well, because everybody deserves an equal education. Everybody. Whether you are special education or general education, Everybody deserves the same ability to be educated. I feel like with everything that I've seen Angela do, everything that I've heard her doing, I am so pleased with the direction that special education is going in this district, that we are here to support her, to thank her, and to know one of the things I said to somebody recently, I said, well, what do you think of Angela? I said, I think she's fabulous. I have not had a hard case with her yet, so hold on, <laughs> hold on. When I'm across the table and we disagree, we'll see where we go. But what I love about Angela is she's willing to think outside the box and figure out how we can meet the needs that we have with what we have. And it's just been wonderful. But again, I will reiterate, if we under budget special education, we will always be over budget. Just think about that. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Eileen, would you just thank you very much? Would you just state your name just for the record, please? Eileen Swan, advocate and attorney and here in Granby. Great. Thanks, Eileen. Thanks so much for being here. Hey, I'm Jenny.
Bussy. I am a mom, and I amen everything that Eileen just said. Um, additionally, we have a new outplacement coordinator. I, as a special needs parent, have a child who's outplaced, and I've had the pleasure of working with Barbara. So thank you, Angela, for bringing Barbara Trinks on. She's been a, a godsend to my family, and I'm sure a lot to a lot of other families. So uh, I agree, Eileen. We're headed in the right direction, and I'm so excited to have all these pieces in place. But that's not why I came up. I came up to tell you that I am hosting a student, a German student. Um, she is a sophomore and through an organization called EF. And um, their, uh, their organization works all over New England, uh, all over the country to place students, international students in high schools. And the coordinator for the New England region said to me, Granby has been the best school to work with. Um, specifically, uh, Colleen Nisbet at the high school has just been incredibly creative and flexible and accommodating. I mean, we've had crying sessions in her office for extended lengths of time as we got adjusted to um, being here. And so um, I hope this is a program that can grow. Um, the feedback that I'm receiving from our student, her name is Feely, uh, it has been that the students have been incredibly welcoming and warm and they started uh, the AFS club I should know what that stands for. What does that stand for? Um, it's American S Field Studies. There we services. go. What studies. is it? It's American Field Studies and Services. Right and so they meet um, once a week to plan different activities and she's just been so happy with how many students have participated in that making them feel so welcome. So I hope that's a program that can continue to grow. This organization um, is it, obviously on the, the last couple of years has been uh, had a really hard time <laughs> with placing students and so they were really well, glad they had two students from Spain and, and one from Germany just here in Granby High School so thank you to the school for allowing that program to continue thank you Jenny thank you for being a host as well yeah. are there any other public comments um, from within this building Mr. Croninger, do we have any online? So we do have Laura Mendoz who said that her audio is a little spotty, so she was wondering if someone could read. Um, I would, I don't have a mic here. Um, I can read her comments. Yes, she has like two, uh, two paragraphs here. I can't really see it very well either. Can uh, Dr. Grossman, what's the precedent for that? Are we allowed to read? We are. Okay. Um, is it from? It's, it's, I can, yeah. Laura Matheos, is that correct? Okay. Yeah. Laura, this is San, 7 Candlewood Lane mm -hmm. yeah. in Granby. Okay. Yeah. Laura, I can read this a lot. This is Sarah, and I'll read this on your behalf. Um, I'm typing my comment because my audio is a little spotty, so maybe someone can read this for me. Um, first, thank you for offering virtual attendance for the meetings. This is very helpful. Um, I'd like to ask the board to consider professional development training for our teachers that focuses on the best way the best ways Sorry. to support no, that's okay to support kids who have emotional and mental health needs. Many kids in the classroom have anxiety or ADHD or sensory issues to name a few examples. They have needs thank you John that are common but can present themselves in unexpected ways. Sometimes teachers may mean to offer support, but in a way that actually makes a situation worse. I don't think all of our teachers know how to offer support in the right way. So my ask is that the board support this sort of training, and my question is what is the best way to continue this conversation beyond the public comment section of this meeting? Um, so, Laura, I hope I did that justice. Uh, while we cannot respond, I will ask you to please contact the superintendent's office. I know he's taken note of your name as well, and my recommendation would be to set up a meeting. Dr. Grossman, does that sound appropriate? Superintendent or Director of Pupil Services. Director of Pupil Services. Okay. And you'll see that in uh, Angela's uh, improvement plan tonight anyways. Wonderful. Yep. Yes, we will. So, yep. so, Laura, please reach out to the superintendent or to the uh, uh, Pupil Services office, please. Was there anything else from anyone who's joining us via Zoom? Okay, I will close public comment then. Thank you very much. Um, consent agenda. Uh, 
So I would ask that we have a motion. I will say, uh, before we make a motion, and Rosemary, I think I'll look to you to maybe make that motion, that, um, actually, why don't you go ahead and make the motion? I move that the Granby Board of Education adopt the consent agenda. And I will second that. Um, and then just, I'll open it up for discussion. We are a very new board. Uh, four out of the six of us here this evening who are uh, board members are new. However, I would like to add that Rosemary and I were both at the last meeting, and Donna was here in person, and Whitney and Monica both joined um, via Zoom. So uh, we had five, one, two, three, five, five of the six of us were present at that meeting, uh, and therefore we do feel comfortable approving the consent agenda. So we have a motion and a second. Uh, is there any more discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any abstentions? I'll abstain. Christina abstains, and there. And there's no one left to say no, so that will pass. Thank you very much. Um, there is no old business to report. Uh, new business. Here we go, Angela. <laughs> so, uh, we have the Pupil Services Department Continuous Improvement Plan with Miss Angela Ehrenberg, Aaron, uh, the Director of Pupil Personal Services. Welcome. Good evening, everyone. Um, I want to thank the Board of Education, um, student representatives, Dr. Grossman, for having me here this evening to present um, the Pupil Personnel Services Continuous Improvement Plan. Welcome to the new board members, and welcome to our community members in person and in Zoom, um, attending via Zoom this evening um, to hear more about the plan. Um, I'm really excited to share um, some of the work that I've done so far with the People Services um, Department. And I think you'll see um, a lot of through lines between this plan and the plans that have been presented by each of the building principals. Um, you know, the work really is linked, um, and there are many parallels. Um, the plan definitely complements the, the work being done in each of the buildings. Um, while also addressing um, specific needs of the department. Okay. So here we have the vision of the graduate, which is um, familiar to folks as a guiding document. So I'm going to move right into um, goal number one, which targets student learning and achievement. Um, so the pupil services department's goal under student learning and achievement is that students with special needs will show measurable gains in academic achievement when provided effective core instruction, specialized instruction, and ongoing monitoring of performance. Um, so um, a strong general education program leads to positive improvements in all students, particularly those with special needs. Um, so continuing to build staff capacity um, in general education standards and core curricular expectations is critical. Um, our pupil services staff will be working on designing specialized instruction that again is linked to standards, um, curriculum aligned, but also evidence-based and individualized to meet student needs. Um, as part of our, um, as part of the student learning and achievement goal, ongoing progress monitoring and ongoing review of data, um, individual student um, performance data, as well as looking at our students um, as a group um, will lead to um, improvements and gains. We are fortunate, very fortunate actually, to have a position, um, new position this year, where we have a pre-K through five instructional special education coach. Um, her primary focus is in the area of literacy. It's a particular um, um, area of specialty for this um, coach, and through that um, coaching model and support, we anticipate seeing improvements um, in literacy for our students with special needs. And finally, our uh, pupil personnel staff provide support and assistance to our intervention teams. Um, so this is for students at all tiers of instruction. They offer kind of their lens and expertise around um, progress across those tiers of instruction and can help um, guide teams when a referral to gather more information potentially through testing is needed. 
So I'm going to review a couple of the um, measures that we're going to use to track um, our achievement of students um, with identified needs. Um, the first measure I'm going to speak to is our STAR assessment data. Um, and this is for students who have individualized education programs. Um, so on the left hand side here we have the STAR um, reading um, targets. So. Um, in grade two, our students with identified needs, 41% of students with identified needs met the fall baseline on the STAR reading assessment. A target for us in the, uh, for our spring goal would be getting that group of students, 50% of those students with identified needs meeting our spring goal. Um, grades three through five, looking at as a group, um, because we have all of our students grades three through five taking the STAR reading. Um, currently, we have 21.7% of our students with identified special needs meeting the fall baseline on STAR reading. Our target would be getting the, that group 32% of students with identified needs meeting the spring goal. Our grades six through eight students with identified special needs, currently 23.7% of those students are meeting our fall baseline on STAR reading. The target would be 34%. Um, and as you can see, I um, generally aim for an approximate 10% increase in students meeting goal from fall to spring in reading. Um, you'll see something similar for math, except when we get to grades six through eight, which I'll talk a little bit more about. So in grade two um, for math, 40% of our students with identified special needs met the um, fall baseline, aiming to get to 50%. In grades three through five, 15.2% of our students with identified special needs met the fall baseline, aiming to get to 25%. And grades th six through eight, um, and I did check this number a couple times to make sure, um, it's currently 3.9% of our students with identified special needs met the fall baseline in math. Um, that, um, so the growth target there would be to 25% to better mirror our grades three through five target. Um, and, um, and that measure is, is not historically what that population looked like. So um, I think we can get there. Can I ask the question, or do you want us to save questions till the end? We should probably do it at the end. At the end? It? Just to okay. be consistent. Okay. Okay. Um, another sets of data that I want to speak about are SBAC and SAT. Um, so um, this SBAC metric um, I thought was um, very interesting and a very kind of helpful way to look at student growth over time. Um, so this, this data looks at a cohort of students in grades four through eight uh, and looking at their demonstrated growth or movement across bands on the ELA and math portions of the SBAC. Um, and so it looks at the same cohort of students who took the SBAC in 2019 and then again in 2021. As you remember in 2020, spring of 2020, the SBAC was not administered due to COVID. So that's why there's that, that gap there. So from those two points in time in ELA, this particular cohort of students showed a 31.6% um, score increase on the SBAC. Um, a growth target would be looking for 41% to show a score increase. In math, again, same cohort of students, those two points in time, 10.5% showed a score increase. We're looking, um, target would be 20% to show a score increase. On the SAT, um, looked at the class of 2023, so that's our current 11th grade students with identified special needs. Um, so this group of students took their PSAT um, in the fall of 2020. So in the fall of 2020, 33.3% of students identified with special needs um, met the evidence-based reading and writing um, state established benchmark. Goal for those students who will take the SAT this spring would be 40% um, of those of um, identified students would meet the, the evidence-based reading and writing benchmark on the SAT in the spring. For math, again, class of 2023, as 10th graders, 
20% of students with identified special needs meant the evidence, um, sorry, the um, math, state, state established math benchmark on the PSAT, looking to move that to 27% of students with special needs meeting the state established benchmark on the SAT this spring. Um, I use 7% as a growth indicator um, to mirror the same amount of growth the high school team um, is expecting in their general population. Okay, goal number two, community engagement. Um, the People Services Department will partner with families to support engagement, ongoing communication, and collaboration between staff and families. Mm -hmm. Um, so, um, as, as you heard a little bit um, about our special education parent-teacher organization, um, it's been a really um, wonderful partnership so far this school year. We entered this school year with our meeting schedule, our location set. We have um, collab, myself and the um, SEPTA leadership have collaborated on agenda items and topics of interest and need for families. Um, we've had nice participation. Our meetings um, are every other Monday, I'm oh, sorry, <laughs> the second Monday of each month. Um, and we've been able to do in-person and a high, uh, more of a hybrid option. So we have folks in person and those some attend virtually as well. Um, so that partnership um, will continue. Um, I've also been highlighting the work of the People Services Department in a monthly newsletter, so hopefully that's made it to some of your inboxes. Um, this past month I highlighted um, Best Buddies, as, um, and I'll talk a little bit more about them in a bit. And then certainly um, the work of the People Services Department um, entails ongoing collaboration with families in a variety of means, PPT meetings, Section 504 meetings, general parent meetings, emails, phone calls, etc. Um, goal number three, safety and social emotional well-being. Um, the People Services Department will support social emotional behavior learning of students and staff to foster a learning environment, a positive learning environment that is responsive and encouraging. Um, so um, as part of um, just the district's uh, professional development plan for this year. There has been ongoing professional development in the area of social emotional learning um, in concert with the assistant superintendent's office. That um, will continue. And so each of the buildings um, engages in that work on a regular basis. Something a little bit more specific to the pupil services department is um, the my team is looking at some refresher training on doing function-based on function-based behavior and looking at um, appropriate skills instruction in, relace to, in relation to some behavioral needs that students may present in the school environment. The pupil services staff, in the same way that they support kind of the academic arm of a tiered intervention process, also support the um, social emotional um, end of things as well by offering um, their professional knowledge, consultation, et cetera. Um, to best support students at all tiers of intervention. Looking also about conducting a district-wide social emotional learning screener. Um, the State Department of Education is making a screener available to districts. Um, we are currently in the spring, the group that would have access to this tool in the spring. Um, so that might be provided everything goes as planned, we get access to the tool. Um, we would be able to administer that and develop some action steps as a result of that. And lastly, um, my office um, partners with the assistant superintendent's office on this um, social emotional learning committee where we're taking a really careful look at our current social emotional learning curriculum, our current interventions, supports at all tiers and all buildings and really doing kind of a deep dive into where we are and what are our um, steps moving forward. Um, goal number four, budget development and fiscal management. Um, the People Services Department will aim to be fiscally responsible through careful identification of needs and appropriate spending to support student learning and growth. 
Um, so as you take a look at um, these bullets, you'll see there's kind of a theme around examining, exploring, um, investigating. So the first is really examining our special education service delivery model in district. Um, so how are we currently providing special education services? What is that looking like? And what does it need to look like in order to support um, our students in being educated in their home communities? Um, some of the you know, pieces I'm looking at are um, you know, what, what, um, what amount of time is our services being delivered in general education? What amount of time are services being delivered in a resource room? Exploring a piloting of co-teaching, particularly at the secondary high school level. Um, is, um, is on my radar as well. Monitoring caseloads and assignments of pupil services staff to ensure appropriate staffing and supports um, are provided across the district. That's something that um, the pupil services office um, does regularly because we have student needs change over time. And, um, and sometimes need to make adjustments that way, but also as we're moving into budget season, making sure that um, we have appropriate um, numbers of staff to support the student needs that we have in front of us. I've also engaged in some initial collaboration with neighboring towns, so East Granby, Suffield, and Windsor Locks, um, to explore some cooperative program development. Um, so that's been um, interesting and um, good, a good way to connect with colleagues also looking to think about um, special education, um, possibly in some different ways. Um, and also this year we'll be investigating the possibility of alternative educational programming within the Granby Public Schools, particularly at our, our secondary level. Right, number five, embracing diversity. So the People Services Department supports the implementation of the Granby Public Schools anti-bias, anti-racism plan by promoting equitable practices and outcomes for all students, particularly those with identified special needs through specialized instruction and programming. So some of the ways that we're embracing diversity in the pupil services um, department is really supporting the mission of our best buddies um, in unified sports. We want to build awareness. We want to expand opportunities. We want to increase membership and participation. And I'll just kind of uh, piggyback on um, Dr. Grossman's um, share about the Friendsgiving today for best buddies. I had a chance to pop by in the cleanup mode, but they were having a great time and it was very well attended and um, it was really wonderful to see. Um, Want to continue to build staff capacity to differentiate instruction and assessment. So um, as our students um, have instruction in their general education classrooms that is um, differentiated to meet their needs, they will experience greater success and be able to participate in access learning better. And lastly, um, it is a responsibility of my office to really examine our special education data for any trends and patterns using an equity lens. So as, um, as you know, patterns come my way, it's important that we really think about what those mean and, um, and develop any next steps that may need to come as a, as a follow-up. And lastly, um, goal number six, professional learning. Um, the People Services Department will provide meaningful professional learning opportunities to enhance practice and increase learning outcomes for students. So in, similar, um, in a similar vein to um, the plans presented by my colleagues, um, the work with the Great Schools Partnership is really critical to um, having a strong um, both general education and special education programming for students. A few spe more specific things. Um, I have a core team of pupil services staff who will be participating or, or receiving um, quality IEP training provided by the State Department of Ed starting in January. Um, it is an eight session training. Our district is, all districts are required to have a core team of individuals trained in preparation for um, the new IEP and 504 platform, which is the following bullet. Um, so having um, this quality IEP training is going to help prepare staff for making that shift to the new um, template and supporting families in best understanding all of those components. 
Um, our new IEP and 504 platform is going to be available by the State Department of Ed in July. So we just continue to await updates from them and, um, and um, expect that everything will be running on time and we'll be ready to go. <laughs> um, and then lastly, one of the one most wonderful things that I enjoy about um, being a director of pupil services is I get to interact with a multidisciplinary team um, almost daily. Um, and so um, what comes with that is needing to make sure that we're, performing, we're supporting the professional development needs of each of those disciplines. So a speech and language pathologist may need different types of training and professional um, supports than a school psychologist, for example. Um, so this year I um, would like to conduct just a simple needs assessment of professional training needs of each of the disciplines and um, you know, come away with some recommendations about supporting um, each of those groups moving forward. Okay. Angela, that is a lot and you remind me you've been with us since July. Is that correct? <laughs> so this is an awful lot of work that you have put into this plan and into this department um, and into our students. Um, and obviously, you know, you have some developed some wonderful relationships with our parents and with our community. So thank you. We're so glad to have you. We're thank grateful you. to have you here. Thank you for all of um, your hard work on this. It has been our practice in our past board meetings. We've kind of just kind of gone around the circle. Um, and I know that Rosemary mentioned that she had a question. So I'll start with Rosemary and we can all work around. If you have something you'd like to ask Mrs. Aaronworth um, or comments, please, uh, now is the time. So Rosemary, I'll begin with you. Thank you. Well, I, I had one question when we were on slide two. Now I have several, but uh, I'm gonna uh, I'll, I'll try to condense. Sure. Um, so on, on the slide where you mentioned the STAR assessment data for, yes. the, for identified students, and, and I think you referenced something about IEP students. Yes. Um, do do we identify uh, assess you know the assessment and the need for students with 504s as well? This data is only reflective of students with IEPs, but yes, it can be further um, disaggregated by 504. Okay. And am I correct to assume that you know we we know the number, we know these identified students, and so when when we get this data, do we then does, do we flip that into their IEP? Is that is that kind of integrated into where their where their plan goes from there, to to kind of get to where that to get to that improvement that fifty percent say for grade two, things like that. Yep. So for um, for each right each student is looked at as an individual as part of their planning and placement team meetings and um, this general ed curriculum data is um, reviewed as part of those meetings. And so um, this data plus specific data on goals and objectives all come together to um, develop a plan for that student. And then um, I guess my next big uh, look under, under goal number three, um, safety and social emotional wellness. Um, so you you talk about examining curriculum and interventions using the CASEL framework. Mm -hmm. um, do you anticipate any changes to the curriculum? <clears throat> and if so, I'm assuming those will go through the curriculum subcommittee? So what I can speak to is as a member of the of the committee, um, so it's a district-wide committee, mm -hmm. um, we will be coming away with some recommendations I, I let Assistant Superintendent Parsons um, kind of take it in terms of what that, what come, where those recommendations go from there. Okay. I, okay. So that's just into curriculum in general, and not necessarily geared toward special education. Right. Right now, right. That we have been looking at our district-wide curriculum at each. Uh, so each building um, has um, kind of a little bit of. You know, each building kind of takes SEL and looks at their needs um, as it relates to that developmental le developmental level. We do have some common some common curriculum like Second Step you've probably heard of, um, and so we're looking at each of those and their effectiveness um, as part of this committee. Okay. So just uh, kind of back to what I think Sarah was your question about any new texts, new coursework, changes in curriculum. I guess we'll see that all, maybe Jen knows this question better, but we're, 
is that going to come through this budget? Uh, you, you ex do, should we expect to see those types of changes or budget implications in this budget coming up? I would say we will be. So where we are with the committee is that we're in the process of making goals for our, our next steps. There are, <laughs> excuse me, there are already several pieces in place for social and emotional curriculum, like our second step curriculum at the elementary schools. So I don't foresee a lot of curriculum adoption in, in budgetary pieces. It's more sort of fine tuning where we are. Um, if we need support in terms of um, resources, consortiums to be part of that, you may see that coming through. Okay. But we're really still at the point where we're taking stock in where we are because there have been individual initiatives going on. Um, we've actually, we're moving into our third meeting yeah. where we're really just <laughs> talking about where have we been, what, what are the best pieces that already live here that we want to keep going with. Got it. Can, can I just add to that just a quick question too? So <coughs> when you say we, you mean the SEL committee? Yes. Okay. And that's made up of? Uh, educators and the two, the yep, two of you. District-wide okay. staff. And, and, and administrators. Mm -hmm. So I guess my question, just to Rosemary's point, is if this, because I think all of our other continuous improvement plans have referenced this CASEL framework. Mm -hmm. um, and I know, Jen, I think you presented a little bit on it uh, back in the spring. I'm just wondering if maybe it's something that the board needs to take like a, a deeper dive and a look at, because if it's, if it's something that's being used for all of our students, um, maybe something that and with newer board members, we should be familiar with what that framework is. Absolutely. And I would say as well that it, it really is just a framework for thinking about social emotional learning. What, what is it? It's a definition and in in an expanded definition through some graphics and some explanations. So, <coughs> excuse me, absolutely we can bring it forward. Um, I would say based on our committee work, Angela, we would um, have some goals to share probably February-ish, um, if that would be an okay time to bring forward both the framework and sort of our, our stock and where we've been and where we want to go. Great. Rosemary, I didn't mean to cut you off. I no, know you had no, a couple more. No, I'm going to never miss a good opportunity to shut up. <laughs> <laughs> that, that was a good segue. <laughs> well, I'll move it over to Christina. If you have anything that you'd like to add. Or... No, it was a fantastic presentation. I don't have any questions at this time, but it's very thorough. Thank you. So I just had one quick, um, I, well, a couple, I guess, quick questions. Um, I know that there's been some transition within the special education uh, department and um, talking about the, the ongoing professional development. How do you cycle in to ensure all of the new staff are receiving that, that professional development? And just another follow-up question is, are all of our special education staff um, do they, are they in one PLC together, or are they, uh, I'm just, I just don't know the answer, so I'm just curious. Yeah, what yeah, so your first question, can you repeat your first question? How oh do gosh, you around professional what it was. Yeah, development? So, um, yeah, the professional development, because okay. I know we've had sure. some transition in staff. Yeah, yeah, so um, I'm fortunate in that each building has a, a content area specialist within special education. So that's a title of a person within special education who has a teacher leadership role. Um, and so those individuals are really key at the building level in terms of orienting um, new professional staff around um, building-based practices, but also um, general special education sorts of topics. I meet with each building monthly as well um, through a department meeting. So that time is um, time that I use to provide some professional training. I've also been doing a bi-weekly newsletter for staff where I've kind of picked out like a, I call it like a procedure or compliance issue, mm -hmm. you know, topic for that, for that time. Um, and we'll add some other notes. So that's been, I've received good feedback from staff. They like it's kind of short and sweet and to the point. Um, and then also, um, we have um, a strong mentor program here where new staff are paired with a, a mentor in special education. And so all of those combined, I think, have really supported um, some onboarding of new staff that we've had. Awesome. Thank you. And then just, um, you referenced in your uh, board goal four with the budget development, you said two things that kind of perked my attention. Caseloads, yeah. um, monitoring caseloads. What's the average caseload for one of our special education teachers? 
or does it vary? It does. It does. Okay. It is going to vary per. Um, it's going to vary per level. Okay. Um, our caseloads with our littler students tend to be a little bit smaller. Mm -hmm. um, their needs tend to be um, require a little bit more attention. Yep. Our caseloads for our older students, our high school students, can tend to be a little bit larger um, than the elementary level um, because we expect students at that level to have more independence and um, and they are able to be um, participate more readily in group learning. Um, some of our younger students, that's the learning. <laughs> it's learning right, how to right. learn in a group. Um, so um, I think our caseloads here are um, are in good shape. And what drives that number? Is it um, is it a best practice? Is it a board guideline or board policy? In terms of caseloads? Yes. Um, so um, so I, stepping in here, my understanding is how the caseloads have been developed is really looking at student service hours and balancing student service hour needs across providers. So you may have um, you may have a caseload, I'll just, you know, come up with the number of eight students, but those students may have very involved and intensive service needs. An another provider may have a caseload twice that number, um, but in terms of service hours, they balance out. Thank you. Donna? I don't have any questions, but thank you for your presentation. Sure. Great. Monica? Um, yeah, if, if I could just ask, um, uh, the, uh, looking at the star data, I'm going to start there. Um, is there any sort of clarification or explanation in regard to the discrepancy with the grades six through eight for reading versus math? I mean, the baseline, there's a, a, a baseline discrepancy that I'm curious about because you can see it's you know, not too far off for the other grades. So I'm curious as to that. Yeah, I, I, I think that um, that, that has uh, been touched on a little bit in prior um, presentations that by um, the building administrators, um, I know that there's been some more intensive curriculum work in math this year as a result of our performance. So I, I do think that number is still low in spite of that. Um, so um, really trying to make that a focus area for that grade. If I remember, is that the number that was a little bit lower for our math with the SBAC scores, the oh, yeah. grade six? Yeah. So, oh, yeah. 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 So, yeah. Okay. So the entire population is lower in math. Got it. Um, and then in regard to uh, board goal number four, the budget development and fiscal management, um, you mentioned the collaborating with neighboring towns. I, I was really excited to, to see that on there. Um, and I was curious to as to uh, whether other towns were contacted or why specifically East Granby, Southfield, and Windsor Locks are identified there, if there was some sort of advantage or... Yeah, so um, I don't have the historical knowledge of why those, why we are a group, <laughs> um, but um, it was one of the things when I first came on, they actually reached out to me and said, um, you know, we kind of started this dialogue and we want to continue it. Um, and so um, we've had a, a kind of a couple of conversations so far. Um, and we'll be actually, um, we're working on scheduling an appointment with um, Brian Klinkowitz, the Bureau of Special, the, Bureau Chief for Special Education at the State Department of Ed, um, just around, just to brainstorm with him around other communities that may have done something similar. Okay. Is there any precedent you know, for other communities in, in this sort of collaborative, collaborative attempt? There are some other, there are some programs where like two towns have come together and created, um, you know, some programming. So um, there are some places that we can look for some ideas. And then right below that, the investigate the possibility of alternative educational programming. Can you just uh, expand for me a little bit what you mean by alternative educational programming? Yeah, yeah. So, um, so we're we we want to investigate um, some alternative programming for our high school students specifically at this point. Um, that's kind of a population that um, you know, social emotionally, we want to. Um, kind of uh, address it in a, in a potentially different way. Um, really, the investigation part is identifying the exact nature of the need and what might a model be. Um, but, you know, we know that um, we do have a population of students who may need something different at our high school level. If you go a little bit deeper, and we'll talk about this more, we have students, and this was mentioned, students that are outplaced. And if we can develop a program in school that provides them the same supports that they're getting outplaced, 
It reduces our budget, number one. But number two, which is most importantly, it'd be nice for kids that are outplaced that live in Granby to be able to wear a Granby shirt, a Granby jacket, be around Granby friends, and not be out of school. So that's what that means. This is something that I can't throw one more thing on Angela's plate yet. <laughs> um, you'll see this in the superintendent goals, and this is something that we spoke about last year um, also that this is going to be an ongoing conversation, but it's about kids coming back to the Granby Public Schools but providing them the best education that we can provide them, but that they feel part and that their families feel that they're going to get the same services that they get outside the district, inside, and we're going to have to look at models outside the district that have already happened. Sarah and I attended a legislative session last year and learned about other districts, and this may be partnering, and this is why some of those school districts that were mentioned, they're smaller school districts, that that's the partnership that we're look, working on. So you'll hear more about this as we go along. That's a great question, okay. Monica. Thank yeah. you. No, thank you. Um, that, that makes a lot of sense. I really I appreciate it, and this is a lot. Thank you very much. <laughs> yeah. And Whitney. Um, yes, I have a few, and a lot of them have kind of been touched upon, so hopefully I can go quick. Um, I'm going to kind of go backwards right off of what Monica was talking about. Um, I know an alternative education program getting into that. By the way, the plan looked wonderful. It was really exciting to see. Um, sorry, I didn't jump right in. No. <laughs> but um, I guess what I'm wondering is, I know um, the alternative education, or bringing the educational program back to Granby is a huge endeavor, um, and it, you know, worries a lot of parents that their kids are outplaced and they need those services. Um, so I'm just curious, like, what kind of, would there be, like, a subcommittee to explore that? Because I know there's, like, a lot, like Jordan said, he threw a lot at you. <laughs> so there, That's a huge endeavor. So I was just curious what the, you know, so like what, what explore would look like. So yeah. this will, this will be something that will be right out of the superintendent's office. Okay. And it will start with a meeting of the administration to kind of formulate a plan of how we want to go about looking at what alternative programming looks like alternative models, what are out there as administrators, and then once we formulate that plan, this will be things that will involve SEPTO in our thinking of what's going on Wonderful. with that. That's why this is not something that we think that we can nail for next fall. Absolutely. There's a possibility, there's a possibility, um, but this is, this is something that there needs to be a long range plan, but parents will be involved, the Board of Ed will be involved, but it's gonna start at the administrative level to say, what do we think? Where are we relative to programming? Yeah, that sounds wonderful. Just, thank you. Thank you. Um, and then as far as number two, the goal of community engagement. Um, I know, I believe this was pre-COVID and pre-joining um, us, but in the past there have been monthly homeschool collaborations that were kind of put in place for children with IEPs. Uh, it was a monthly meeting or a bi-monthly meeting where everybody would check in. Um, it was kind of a formal plan that they just put in place and had it on the schedule. Is that um, still in place as far as um, having that communication in place? Yep, so homeschool collaboration meetings are happening. Mm -hmm. um, they can be virtually, if that works better for the family, or in person. Mm -hmm. um, and um, in many cases, you know, it's, it's outlined in the IEP okay. um, that that is something that, um, you know, was agreed to. So those are, um, those are in process. Okay. Um, and I believe two more questions, I'll be quick. Um, the social emotional learning, um, within that training and um, uh, programming, are there trauma informed um, services in place? Or trauma informed services training in place, I guess? Yep, yep. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so that, um, yeah, that is definitely a component of okay. the work, and um, it's certainly a component that. Um, is an area where um, I would say most districts are enhancing um, their staff's capacity to understand trauma-informed practices. Wonderful. Thank you. Very last question, um, and I will stop, I promise. Um, with the um, budget development goal, um, I know you said the towns that you've been speaking to were kind of already in place, um, but I was curious if the conversation was discussing that with Heartland has ever come to the table, because we do accept their students in the high school, is that correct? Yes. Okay. So I didn't know if that would be something that has been explored in the past or that could be explored? Um, I'm not sure if it's been explored in the past, okay. but I do know we partner with them closely for our, um, you know, for our high school students. Right. Um, and they are part of shared services as well. So, right. but, um, and we do connect um, as a region, but 
And that's not a bad suggestion. Okay. Thank you yeah. so much. I really appreciate it. It was a wonderful presentation. Thank you, Whitney. And I'll check in with Pat and Jacob if you had anything you wanted to ask or add. Um, I don't want to exclude you guys. But I'll second. Okay. Thank you, Angela, again, thank you very much. Thank this you. was obviously, this was a, um, a very big, uh, heavy lift that you've done in just a sh really short amount of time. Um, and we're excited to have you with us. So thank, thank you. you for all thank your Thank you so work. much, everyone. Thank you. All right. Um, moving on to the next item on the agenda, we have a draft of the 2022-23 school calendar. And I know that Dr. Grossman has a couple of things that he was going to point out for us. Again, this is just kind of the first look at this um, at this calendar. We're not approving it or anything like that tonight. Is nope. that correct? We're just looking at it. Super. Thank you, Mrs. Brown. <laughs> just to uh, let the Board of Education and Community know, this is the first read of the 22-23 calendar. This calendar has been vetted by the administration and um, had involvement with the teachers union and our professional development committee. This calendar is very similar to years past. There are three uh, items that I'd like to bring up about that we were one of the few districts that started a, a week earlier last year than a lot of districts. So we did make that change that our uh, students will be starting on August 30th. And what you'll notice is the first two days of August 30th and August 31st are two half days. We feel that uh, the things that we've learned during this pandemic is that we'd like to transition students into school and get to know students and have them transition back. But also, it allows uh, teachers to even formulate more relationships with kids, but also to go through more plans with teachers and individualized plans that are coming forward from the new grade. So you'll notice that the first two days are half days, and I'll also add a plug in. As you know, our buildings are not air conditioned, and I did have to call half days on those two days uh, last year, not saying the weather would be the same. So that's the first change. The next change is that our professional development committee really discussed how often and when we need professional development days. And what was really disruptive is the, the month of October and the, 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 the teachers struggle with having students in continuity of only three day weeks that they feel that it's disruptive part of the educational environment. So you'll notice on October 11th, after October 10th, is that we do not have that professional development day on October 11th. We move that uh, full day professional development to March 10th. So that was a, a, the, the third major change of this calendar. Everything else is the same as of um, last year. There's the same amount of half day professional development days. And so there's just the three changes of the first day of school, early release, and the professional development day from October 11th to March 10th. I'll take any questions at this time. Thank you, Dr. Grossman. Do we have any questions for Dr. Grossman on the calendar? Again, this is just a first look, so um, feel free to take it home, digest, and we would have looked to we approve this later on. In the you'll approve it. You'll notice that there's not a graduation date on that. We'll set graduation date next, next year. Okay, great. Thank you, Dr. Grossman. Thank you. Okay. Uh, we have a couple of policies. Uh, that uh, Those are our next uh, items on the agenda. Rosemary is the former chair of the Curriculum Subcommittee. I know that you um, reviewed these policies in the Curriculum Committee. I was hoping that you would maybe help us read into those, please. Sure. Um, the first one um, is uh, the first reading, although we've had many, many, many readings <laughs> of our vision, mission, goal, but that's our, this is the, the official policy, revised policy 0200. So that comes to the, uh, we, we passed it out of subcommittee last time, so this is, it's now in the hands of the full board for, um, for the first reading. Great. And I don't believe you received any, or Jet, uh, Mrs. Parsons, you didn't receive any feedback from the board. Okay, wonderful. Thank you. And um, and, and then the second policy is uh, again comes to 
comes to the full board, uh, it's the communications, communication with the public. Um, and, um, I haven't received any, any. And this is a new policy, is that right? Or is it a revised, oh, it looks like it's this, revised. This is, this is a revision. revised policy. Okay. Yeah. And, um, the revision is a legal revision um, based on new legislation that came down. Following the pandemic, one of the pieces that um, came into legislation is the alternative to have parent teacher conferences virtually. Okay. And so this uh, will preserve that option moving forward. I figured it was a virtual component or mm -hmm. something. Um, great. And just a, just kind of as a point of order, for, or not point, point of order, but just to clarify to our new board members, uh, typically our practices is we have policies that go through our curriculum subcommittee um, and they usually do one reading sometimes they might do two and then they forward that to the full board and the board has a first reading and then a second reading to review that policy uh, after that second reading so the next time that this policy is on the agenda is when we approve that so if you read the policies between now and our next meeting please send any comments or feedback that you may have to uh, mrs. Parsons or to now Dave Pelling who is the chair of the, sub the curriculum subcommittee uh, and that can be discussed at our board meeting. Did I summarize that correctly? Okay, good. <laughs> Wonderful. Thank you, Rosemary, for stepping in and, and no helping us with that. Uh, miscellaneous board standing committee reports, um, the curriculum policy, technology, communication. Um, their minutes were attached. I don't think that they met this evening, so there's no update from them. Uh, the Finance Personnel Facilities Committee, uh, they did meet on Friday. They will have their meet minutes in our next meeting, and that was really to overview the statement of accounts uh, with Mrs. Robbins, and that meeting for the Finance Personnel Facilities meeting will be on December 7th. It will be 15th. Thank you, Linda. <laughs> December 15th. Thank you. Uh, other board-related reports, Crack and Cave. I know uh, Mark used, Fiorentino used to uh, give us an, an update on Crack. Uh, he is not here, and we will be reassigning one of our board members to be our Crack liaison. Uh, the Cave, though, as Dr. Grossman mentioned earlier, uh, we did attend the Cave conference on Friday, Dr. Grossman and myself, where we received the Level 2 Cave Awards. We actually received them for both 2020 and 2021. So thank you to the board for all your hard work uh, in achieving those honors. I also wanted to recognize, as they were recognized at the at the conference, Rosemary Weber uh, and Jenny Emery uh, for 10 years of service on the Board of Education. So thank you to you. That's why I'm great. <laughs> And then finally, uh, Dr. Grossman and I actually, because with our CAVE Awards, we did um, have a photograph with the Connecticut Commissioner of Education. Is it Charlene Russell Tucker? Yeah. Okay. Well. Great. So we will, I'm sure, be sharing that in a future update. Granby Education Foundation, Dr. Grossman. Oh, actually, <laughs> we've got several people here who are very familiar with Granby Education Foundation. Whitney, Whitney. Did either of you want to give us an update on what happened at the last GEF meeting? Uh, so, um, I think of notable things, um, we are really excited to be working with the high school on the um, new um, audiovisual, what we call that? Broadcast, Broadcast studio. studio. Mm -hmm. um, so that is kind of getting underway. Um, Dr. Grossman kind of gave us an update and the plans are moving along really nicely. Um, we're really excited. We're going to be bringing back the Grand B. Um, that's going to happen, I believe, tentatively April 22nd or the 23rd. We are thinking probably the 22nd. It's a Friday. It tends to work better for students. Um, we also, let me think here, um, we heard from the high school they're going to be doing a poetry jam, yes. um, which is very exciting. Um, and in January, wait a minute, I have it in my notes. Maybe not. I just jumped from one, one meeting place to another. <laughs> um, one group to another, I apologize. But um, that is coming up in January, and that is very exciting. We were um, asked to, the GEF was asked to uh, be a judge for that. Okay. And um, other than that, we're very excited to like hear grants uh, requests from teachers or other organizations. And I think that's everything. 
Thank you, Whitney. I didn't mean to put you on the spot, but thank I'm you. That was, a really, okay. no, that was a great summary of thank what uh, is going on at GEF. And again, um, Jenny Emmer used to be our representative on GEF, so we will be appointing a board member uh, to continue to make sure that the Board of Education is represented there. A uh, calendar of events is included in the back of your packet. Um, I know tomorrow is an early release. For you guys, so <laughs> I bet you're, I know my daughter was excited about that. So, um, and of course, uh, fall coffee house, and we have conferences coming up as well. Um, so we look forward to all that coming up in the future. Any board member announcements? No announcements. Um, any action items? And Donna, we didn't give you the heads up, but as the newly elected secretary, <laughs> if there were an action item, that would be this would be the time that you would report out on that. But I don't believe we had any action items. I have not been so advised. <laughs> <laughs> so it's on you from now on. So, <laughs> so I don't believe we had any action items. And there is no need for an executive <laughs> session, so I will take a motion to adjourn. So moved. Rosemary, a second? A second. Was that you, John? Yes. Okay. Um, all in favor? Aye. 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 All right. Meeting adjourned. Thank you.